Okay. Hi, guys. Um, thanks for coming at 5 o'clock to a session. Awesome of you. Um, I'm Karen Borchard, and this is uh, my wonderful colleague, Mike Potter, and we are from Phase 2. And we are um, two of the members of the Open Atrium product team, as well as um, some additional things that we do at our jobs. Uh, but that's, that's how we are representing ourselves here today. Um, this is a session called Open Source Products, Unicorns, or Game Changer. Um, it is, uh, I promise there will only be one or two pictures of a unicorn. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started and talk a little bit about this. So um, there's a lot of speculation and a lot of questions um, around open source and productization in open source. Um, so at the Business Summit yesterday and at pretty much every DrupalCon and Drupal Camp and Business Summit, there are questions of can we create products in Drupal? Can we create open source products? Do, op do, do products work in open source? Um, and so there's a lot of questions about how do you build a product the open source way? Um, how do you prevent competition when you can't protect the code? And and how can you make products work when you're a services company? So these are the questions we hear all the time. Um, and a lot of people ask us about it because we've had some experience in working on products um, and distributions of Drupal code, um, like Open Publish and Open Public and Open Atrium. Um, so the question often comes back, you know, is it even possible? Or are we just kind of fooling ourselves into thinking that there that you could create an actual product in open source and take it to market successfully and, and build even potentially a, a successful products company in open source. Um, oh, whoops. Uh, so there's so so, so it is uh, the question of today. We're going to play a little game called uh, unicorn uh, reality or game changer. Um, and talk a little bit about some of the myths and some of the things that happen um, and that people think around open source and products uh, and what you can, you know, what the reality really is and how open source can actually be a game changer. Because we actually believe that open source is not only um, a place where it is possible uh, to build products, but a place that it can be um, even more beneficial or a game changer uh, to create better products. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, use the context of Open Atrium, which is a distribution um, that we uh, built and launched and sent out into the world and have been working on um, for the past year or so. Um, so a lot of our examples come from our experience there. Um, and so why? I mean, this is this is a good question. Um, this is not because we are uh, products pushers or that we are trying to you know change the way uh, that everybody runs their runs their Drupal companies. There are there are a million wonderful things about being a services company in Drupal. We know because uh, we are part of a services company in Drupal. Uh, but as businesses and and business owners start to think about how do we diversify, how do we create more value, how do we push our the code that we're building ahead. Head, um, people start to think about products, and we don't want there to be limits. So we're excited about the idea of, of what can happen with products in, in open source, um, and that's why we're talking about it today. So um, there's three places that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about product development, which is actually building the thing. Uh, we're going to talk about go-to-market, which is taking the product to the rest of the world and getting it out there and selling it. And we're going to talk about balancing services work and, uh, and, and product work. Um, and so we're going to look at, at a few myths, uh, a few realities, and a few game changers in each one. Okay, ready? Um, so myth, first myth. Uh, the only way to build an open source product is with a SaaS hosted distribution. Um, this is a myth that we hear a lot. People think, you know, if I can't build, if I can't create a hosted, you know, SaaS spin it up distribution, it's not, a, it's not a product. It's not an open source product. It's not a Drupal product. And that is a unicorn. Um, the reality is there are tons of business models around, around open source that can work. Um, modules hooked up to services like you see with um, a product like Node Squirrel. Um, open source code packaged with services and integrations that um, the services and the integrations that are, that are coupled together with the open source code create that product. Um, or even productized service offerings around open source code um, can be great examples of you know, product companies or product-like companies uh, 
that really take the advantage of you know things like fixed pricing and um, and and really really clear parameters around a product, um, but use open source code. So um, definitely definitely not just uh, if you, uh, you have to build a distribution and have a SaaS version of it in order to have an open source product. Um, and the game changer here is open source allows you to focus more on finding the right business model and less on protecting your IP. So when you're kind of free of the idea of of worrying about what if I, if how do I protect what I'm building? How do I protect all this code and make sure nobody steals it and nobody takes this idea? Um, if you spend your time working on and thinking about your business model and how you're actually going to take it to market, you're spending your time better than worrying about, you know, okay, how do I how do I make sure that uh, nobody else builds, you know, the next best widget or the next best feature? Um, so the hint on this one, we have a hint on all of these, is um, don't be afraid to change it. Don't be afraid to change the business model if the market changes um, or if the business model changes or if the product changes, or if something's not working. Um, so in, in building products, uh, focusing on how you're going to get it to the world rather than how you protect its IP is, is really big. Uh, okay, this one I'm ha passing over to, to our, our, chief, uh, our, our chief of um, all, all contribution on Open Atrium, Mike Potter. Product architect. Okay, so uh, can, is this on? It doesn't sound like it. It doesn't. Okay. Okay, we'll trade. Uh, okay, so the, the unicorn myth here is that no one wants to work on somebody else's distribution or product or module. And, you know, part of that's maybe true sometimes. But the reality is if you can focus on what you really want to do and focus on building with the best contributed modules, which is what we did in Atrium, then you've got more contributors. You don't have to do it all yourself. Uh, the example of this is in Open Atrium. One of my development mantras really early on in the, the Drupal 7 project was proudly invent elsewhere, which I stole from Angie Webchick. She was talking about it in terms of Drupal 8 at the time, about Symphony and those things. Um, but I applied that to Open Atrium. So, you know, the the what we did is we built Open Atrium on the Panoply distribution. And we let Panoply from Pantheon do all of the layout control and all the WYSIWYG. You know, I didn't want to spend my personal development budget writing another WYSIWYG editor for Drupal. That problem's been solved. I wanted to focus my time on the actual collaboration pieces that are in Open Atrium. So by building on the community, building on the best modules out there, we ended up with a much, much better product for a much, much smaller budget. So if you're wanting to do a product and you've got a limited budget, you know, build on the best of what's out there and don't be afraid to contribute back you know, help them fix bugs because those are going to help you uh, in the long run. So the game changer there is other people help you build a product in a really cool way. Um, and the hint is don't let your ego get in the way of your best product. And I, I you know, I practice this all the time. I, the more contribution I can get, the better, the happier I am. The happier I am. And the better the product. And the better the product. <laughs> right. Um, okay, so now, so outside of just developing it and building it, you actually have to get the thing to customers and you have to get the thing to market. So we're going to talk about um, some myths around open source and products um, in the go-to-market strategy. Um, so, myth. So we talk about this a lot. I think I say this at most every DrupalCon. Um, there's a myth. You cannot sell open source code. Um, the reality is you can, in fact. Um, you just cannot prevent anyone else from doing so. That's actually a very common uh, myth around, around open source uh, licenses, and it's something that people need to know. If you don't know it, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good and helpful thing to know. Um, the game changer in, is that in open source, you differentiate on what you know and how you deliver, not on the thing that you built or the, or the IP that you own. Um, so that's actually a really big deal. And in fact, it makes for a better product and happier customers. Because again, what you're focusing on is how you deliver it, how you serve your customers, and how you, uh, how you make it work for the market, and less on uh, the exact, exact perfect thing that you built. Um, next myth. Um, if I'm going to have a product, I'm going to need a partner program. This is a myth that, that we hear. Uh, people think, oh, well, you know, these product companies, like, you know, they always have these, you know, affiliate programs and partner programs. I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to need that. I don't even have, know how to do that, and I don't even know how we would do that. Um, the reality is, if you aren't both getting something out of the deal, you're not partners. Um, so the idea of taking something to market with a partner or a partner program um, really is all about creating mutually beneficial partnerships. But the game changer is that in open source, open source is built on the idea of collaboration and partnerships. So finding what is beneficial to you and what is beneficial to me and how can we take this product forward into our customers this way um, can make for really, really 
powerful partnerships. Um, a really good example of this, I, we're giving Pantheon all kinds of love with Panoply in this, <laughs> but a great example of this is, um, you know, we had, um, we had a, a lot of people asking us early in our product days, you know, oh, well, is there a hosted version? There are two questions. Is there a hosted version? And is there anywhere I can just spin it up? Uh, those were always the questions. I just want to try it out. I just want to spin it up. Well, we're not a hosting company. That's not what we do. It's it's not something that we that we really offer our customers. So for a long time, we kind of thought that the answer was no. And it actually sometimes stood in the way of us bringing customers onto um, products like Open Atrium and Open Public because people couldn't see it. They couldn't spin it up quickly and easily. So they couldn't evaluate it. Um, and it was a really big problem. Um, we ended up having um, a, a really great partnership, a true partnership where there's mutual benefit um, with Pantheon on this uh, because they said, hey, we can do that. We can host distributions and we can get a really quick spin up of these things. And uh, we can do that all on our side. And it'll be great for us because we'll get more people coming to uh, Pantheon. And it'll be great for us uh, for at phase two because we don't have to provide that service, but we can say yes. Um, and being able to say yes to customers is huge when you're building a product. So now when people say, is there a hosted version or can I spin it up and try it out, um, our answer is yes. And so finding the true benefit to each is the hint here. Um, but in open source, you can really do that because you're at a place like DrupalCon where you see all of these different partners. People want to help each other out. People want to be partners with one another. Um, it's all just about finding the real true mutual benefit. Uh, okay, this one's yours. This one? <laughs> Switch. Switch. <laughs> So the, the unicorn myth, I can't build a product because the community needs too much in the issue queue. Like, I'm going to spend all my time answering issues in the issue queue. Uh, if you're a module maintainer, uh, you can relate to this. Um, the reality is that your issue queue is actually your friend. Uh, community members are your first customers, and you should be treated as such. The kind of better you treat the people in your issue queue, the better they'll treat you. Um, and our game changer is community members can become great allies, marketers, salespeople, contributors to your work. Uh, listen to them, thank them all the time, uh, and be a great community member You know, on top of that. That's, that's my background before coming to phase two. I was heavily involved in the community. I still am with features and things. It was really important for me to keep the community, uh, community spirit to this. Um, so the example for this is I'm going to pick on uh, David Snowpick here who's in the front row. Uh, he was greatly involved in the alpha version and the issue queue reporting bugs and and you know he wanted to he was really interested in the whole case tracker thing which we were telling people we weren't doing because we just didn't really have the budget and he's like well I need a case tracker so I'm going to write one and so he wrote the work tracker module which eventually became part of our core distribution that you get uh, as part of Open Atrium that does kind of the old case tracker issue tracking stuff and he's been just a really valuable uh, ally and community member and great to have somebody else who understands the stuff to toss ideas off of and and it's it's resulted for you as a community in a much much better product with better functionality and then it's not just this phase two thing it's it's really shows that other people can get involved we do value having other people involved um, and and so we, we encourage that and I think any product that has that model um, it's what you put into it the more you put into it and the more you put into that community the more your payback you get from that all right now, a couple of last myths uh, in unicorns around balancing products and services. This is a big one, and I'm just not going to lie to you at all. This is really difficult. It's really, really hard to do. Um, you know, everybody has trouble doing this. It's a it's a known thing across open source and non-open source alike. If you are running a services company and you make your living on services, it is difficult to add um, or to complement that with products work. It just is. Um, but I think, and we think that there are some really great things, especially in open source, that really help it. Um, so myth. Um, myth is your product is a completely different offering or area of expertise than your services. So we have uh, heard time and time again people say to us, oh, yeah, I really want to create a product. What we want to do is get all of our developers and all of our guys in a room, and what we're going to do is we're going to think up a really cool idea for a product. And then we're going to build that product. And that is actually um, a, a really big red flag. Uh, the reality is products work best when they follow your core competencies as a company. So a lot of the work that we've done in, in building Open Atrium uh, was in helping to understand how our clients collaborate and communicate with one another and share assets and information. Um, similarly, a lot of our work on Open Public, which is a distribution for the public sector, uh, was built on building government websites. Um, when you can have a 
product that actually follows your core competencies and is not a super separate thing from it, um, you are actually bringing so much more expertise and thought leadership and quality uh, to the product, and that's going to really show. Game changer, um, services work is built in market research. Um, this is true, and this is the same hint as before. Listen to them and then thank them. Um, if you are getting to figure out uh, what you might want to build in a product by working with actual real customers, uh, then your product is going to be more relevant and it's going to be of better quality. So if you are working with a client, you've built a little prototype of a product, and they say, these are the 10 reasons that that thing sucks, just say thank you, because that would have cost so much in market research for you to get. What real customers think of your product is the best thing that you could get. Um, and then this is our last one, uh, the myth. You need a dedicated team in venture capital to truly launch a product. Um, a lot of people think this or wonder this. You know, If I'm going to create this product or I'm going to create um, an offering out there, um, I have to wall off a whole team and dedicate a whole load of, of venture capital or outside money in order to make this happen and put them in a special room somewhere so that they can go off and do that um, and it won't disrupt our services company. Um, the reality is uh, products can and should be built with a, more of a product maturity model so that it allows you to say, you know, let's take a, something from concept to a research and development phase to more of an operational phase to a, to a true product with you know, where there are milestones and thresholds and you make investments. That's actually how product investment works in the real world. It doesn't happen um, with just dumping a whole bunch of money into a product. It happens by uh, investing in ideas and prototypes and seeing proof of concept. Uh, the game changer here is uh, Potter has a lot of experience and so he's going to tell you about it. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, you're a services company, so try to find clients within your current services company that are willing to work with you on this. You know, the going halvesies with a client to fund your product, you know, gives you the great client feedback. You're actually using your product to solve a real problem. It makes the product a whole lot better, uh, and they're helping you with the funding. So you still make that investment. You know, the client's not paying all of it. You make an investment. You you have the client understand what you're doing, understand that they're building a, a site on a maybe immature product, but that they're going to help develop that and that they're putting money into this. Uh, this was actually a really key success factor for Open Atrium uh, last year, actually, at around this time, uh, as we were working on a project for an organization called AHRQ, which is the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research, or Research and Quality. Um, they needed a collaboration system. It's basically an internal intranet. And they really were interested in Atrium. They really liked that where it was going. But this was last you know, May. The alpha had just come out. Uh, for example, it didn't have uh, event calendars. And they really, really needed event calendars, so they funded the event calendar development in Open Atrium. Ended up being a huge part of the, the product feature set. They were able to drive it so that it exactly met their, their requirements and their functionality. So, you know, it was the best of both worlds. So if you're up front with your clients, you know, a lot of clients are willing to do this. They, they're picking open source. They're picking Drupal for reasons. Uh, they want to be open source contributors. Um, some of them will want their name out there. Some of them might not, but they really are interested in, in getting involved and helping with this. So, uh, you know, don't pretend or don't think that your clients can't help you with this when, in fact, they can. Right. And when I when we say going halvesies, um, what we mean is that sometimes you can get a you can have a client who will be willing, just like AHRQ was, to fund a specific feature as you know as it relates to the the thing that they need or that they want built. But you can also bring it into the product. You can also say you know to a client, we will invest some time, some extra time uh, beyond the budget of this project in order to in order to build this in a more product way, in a more generic way, or in a way that we can reuse. Um, and going in you know, kind of going half season contributing to um, both, you know, a client project with some additional investment can really boost your product development uh, time and budget. So then you have um, the work of the project and the work that you've invested and you go together on it and it creates a great product for your client um, and a great product for, for your company. Um, so takeaways, I'm just going to reiterate our, our few hints. Um, don't be afraid to change your business model. That's a, one of the beauties of, of open source is that you can, um, you can really figure out what's working with your product, uh, what's happening in the market, and, and focus your time on that rather than on proprietary code. 
Uh, find the true benefit to each partner when you're, when you're engaging in partnerships. Treat your community as your customers. Uh, be upfront about product development with clients. Uh, and, and finally, don't let your ego get in the way of building and delivering your best product. And I, I put that one last because I do think um, that it is an amazing um, opportunity in open source. It's what we all sort of ask each other to do in open source is to, is to contribute and improve and continue to build things. And that goes for products too. It doesn't stop um, at community contributed uh, modules and things. So those are our takeaways. Those are our myths debunked, uh, some, some ways that we think it's a game changer. Um, if you have questions, a lot of times people have questions or just want to uh, talk through ideas around, around open source and products and productization, um, we would be really happy to help yes, answer your questions. Mike. Have them come up to the microphone. Oh, yeah, maybe can. just jump yeah. up to the microphone if you've got a question. Yeah. So, is on? It is on. Um, so you guys have been really good about uh, updates in Open Atrium since Drupal 7, but there was a period with Atrium and Drupal 6 where that's not so great. And Open Public and Open Publish both have known security issues on Drupal.org right now. Um, there was a period with Open Publish for over a year where people were trying to get patches uh, committed to get those updates made, and there was no response from Phase 2 whatsoever. So while Open Atrium is going well, how do you reconcile, and I know you guys work primarily in Open Atrium, but how do you reconcile as an organization uh, the need to maintain those or transfer ownership of them open it up to additional contributors versus just keeping ownership and letting those things go stale like that? Right. Um, it's a great question. Uh, super, super valid question. I'm going to start and then you can finish. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, so the, the, um, one of the very truest answers to that is we've learned a lot. Um, a lot, and we and we haven't always done it right. And I don't think that I don't think that any of us, you know, think otherwise. Um, it's it's really really challenging to figure out all of the best ways to do this. These are some of the lessons that we've learned. Um, we focus a lot more time, energy, and investment on making sure that things are right uh, on on Open Atrium as one of our more active products right now. Um, because of those lessons that we've learned. Um, I will also say that, you know, the part of how we figure out where to spend that time and energy, because again, it's, it is limited, um, as it is for all of us, um, is where we are using things the most. So we are, you know, if we are using Open Public or Open Atrium um, over and over and over again to accomplish the work of our organization, um, we spend more time and we're able to spend more time really going through the community and the issue queue. Open Publish is, um, to be really honest, with you a, a distribution that that we don't really use very often in our projects. It just a lot of our projects don't call for it, um, and so it hasn't gotten as much as, as much um, maintenance and, and love. To be honest with you, um, we haven't always done it right. I'm not going to say otherwise, um, but that's that's why that's how we've done it. Yeah, to follow on that, just to generally. First, it's what we came back to what Karen said earlier about making sure that your products fit with your core competencies. That you know, if you aren't using your products, they're going to languish. And, and you need to be willing, essentially, to, to kind of cut at some point and recognize that, hey, we're not really doing this, and maybe let's open it up to the community, which is what's basically happening with Open Publish right now, is we aren't using it, and so it's going to the community to, to maintain. But it's also, you know, honestly, it does take some, some community people to stand up sometime too you know it's and anyone in here who's done modules like you know I do features and I'm always looking for people to help there you know everyone's got limited time and the number of people who actually contribute to Drupal is a very very small percentage compared to the number of people that use Drupal and so it's sometimes very difficult to find people who who want to step up and be maintainers um, I, I think in all these things, when you put it out on Drupal.org, you know, it's important to recognize that it's, it's, you know, phase two doesn't own these things. They are open source distributions, and we welcome contributions. And, but the reality is we also have limited money. We're a services company. We're going to get busy with client work, you know, at the same time. So, so there's always a balance. You know, I, I, you know, my main thing is treat people as people. You know, sometimes in the issue queue, it kind of is like, you know, phase two, like, owes people something for doing this. Like, we're, we're just community members, too. You know, we're trying to do our our jobs. We're trying to do the best thing. You know, Karen says we learned from this. I think we're doing a better job with Atrium 2. Uh, I think we learned with, with Atrium 1. We were trying to kind of figure out, you know, after we acquired that from development seed, like, you know, what is this thing like a product and what do we do with this and, and you know, how do you move that forward in D7 in some way? Like, it, it took a while to struggle with that and talk to the community about what they wanted to do, too. 
Um, so no, no easy answers there. Like I said, I just hope that we keep doing it better and that some of those things are more, more in the past. And certainly if there's an issue in open public that's a security issue, like that should be getting taken care of because that is one we, we still do, uh, do support. I have a question about uh, the pricing model. So you talked yeah. about um, open source products don't have to be software as a service. Right. Um, so if you deliver your product to your client and they put it on their server, um, in many software licensing models, you're charging them on a per user basis. But once they have your code, you really have no need, you know, have, you have no way to restrict what they're going to charge you um, or what you're going to charge them, rather. Right. How do you deal with um, generating recurring revenue and selling the idea of recurring revenue when you're delivering an open source product that can't be licensed on any kind of uses, usage basis? Right. So um, from our perspective, uh, it's a great question. Uh, from our perspective, we don't, we've never looked at or explored the idea of licensing um, if we're not, if it's not uh, in combination with some other kind of service. So if we're not providing, you know, if, if it's not with a hosting subscription or if it's not with a, um, you know, a subscription to, to, you know, or we're not uh, helping to maintain some integration or something like that, uh, we're not going to just put the code on somebody else's service and then start charging a license fee for it. Um, to us, that doesn't seem like the right, it doesn't seem like a very viable model um, to just do that. In terms of creating recurring revenue, though, or creating opportunities for that, um, there are some ways to do that. Hosting is, is you know, a hosted version is certainly one. Um, the idea of putting together a partnership where you say, you know, we, we're going to integrate our, our open source code base with this uh, paid service and we're going to offer these two things together um, as an integration and charge for that on a on a regular basis. Um, that's a, that's a way that we can that you know you can see some recurring revenue um, and the ability to start to to create you know kind of um, really specific. Uh, service offerings and, and be able to create repeatable service offerings. Even if it's not fully passive revenue, it does create recurring and easier to accomplish revenue. So, um, you know, revenue around uh, like a training, you know, that you perform the same training for, for a product over and over and over. Yeah, that's services. It's time. Uh, but once you've done it and you've built the curriculum and you've built the materials and you know how to do it, you can, you can kind of create that recurring revenue opportunity over and over. Um, so I don't think that I think it's really hard to just you know create straight up license uh, on on an open source base for the exact reasons that you said, uh, but I think that there are some other ways to create recurring and, and potentially passive revenue there. Any other questions? All right, thanks guys. Thanks. Have a great afternoon. Have a good evening.